since we don't have yet a full house, I can take the liberty of playing a little game. Oh wait, and then we'll be done, right? So I'm going to say something and I want you to respond back. Shalom Aleichem. Half of you didn't say anything. Shalom Aleichem. Shalom Aleichem. My name is Isuma. My name is Gabe. Thank you. Shalom Aleichem. My name is Isuma Ginsburg. No, wrong. If I say Shalom Aleichem, you say Aleichem Shulam. If I say Shalom Aleichem, my name is Isuma. You say Shalom Aleichem, my name is Moshe. If I say Shalom Aleichem, my name is Isuma Ginsburg. You say Aleichem Shulam, my name is Moshe. People don't necessarily think like that. The more information you actually share, the more information you get back. So if you're here today and you want to meet somebody else and say, Shalom Aleichem, what's your name? That doesn't always work. And when you get an answer, it's, unless you're talking to someone who's like going to try to push you something very shortly to buy something, it's quite likely you're not going to get the response that you want. But when you say, Shalom Aleichem, my name is Isuma Ginsburg from Flatbush, or from Michelin at this point. What's the, what are you going to get back? Something similar, something that's going to mirror what you said. So the more information you share, the more information you'll get back. Now, one of the interesting things about when someone says, what do you do? What do you do for a living? So most people try to come up with a, what's it called, an elevator pitch. They try to say in as few words as possible exactly what they do and sort of push everything they do into one little sentence that they can push out there and hopefully that person will remember it. That's not what an elevator pitch should be. That's not what an elevator pitch really is. It's not what an introduction really is. What you're really trying to achieve when you, tell, when, you, when you are introduced to somebody is you're trying to get out of their filing cabinet. What that means is, is that if you say, my name is Moshi Weiss, and I am an attorney, or I am a real estate broker. No, I'm not talking about a specific person, I just picked a random name. Um, so what happens is, is that they have a filing cabinet in their head, like a phone book. And they have attorneys, grocery stores, accountants, pizza stores, and you have just, congratulations, you have just put yourself in that filing cabinet among all the other people that they know who are attorneys, who are real estate agents, and that's the end of the story. The go what you really want to do is you want to be able to open the conversation so that it goes beyond just, hi, this is me and this is what I do. Shalom Aleichem, my name is Issam Ginsburg. Aleichem Shalom, my name is Gabriel Solomon. What do you do for a living? Can I ask what you do for a living? Me? Hmm? I, happen to, I happen to ask you, if you're not comfortable, just show me like that. In education. Okay, what do you do for a living? I'm an inventor. Inventor. What do you do for a living? Attorney. An attorney. Okay. What kind of attorney? Work. Okay. So you're a divorce attorney. Your name is? Rabbi Yossi Perlson is a divorce attorney. Is anybody here who passed the sign on the outer bridge on the way here that's on the Verizon that said, Life is worth living, don't jump? Okay, so you decided not to do that? He's the man you want. Khalil. <laughs> Now, ask me, and you, ask me. You know how people have like this mental filing cabinet that you say what you do and then you just go into a filing cabinet? So what I do is not so easily defined. I can't tell it to you in one sentence that would enable you to put it in your filing cabinet. So the follow-up to that is, okay, what do you do? And now we're not in that one sentence pitch anymore. Now I can actually have a conversation with you about what I do and so on and so forth. Did you say you're from you? Yes, I did. There we go. We're lens lights. Give him a hand, please, everybody. So who came further, kilometer-wise, me or you? You, yeah. Sure. So I, I think I came the furthest, unless we have, we have some South Africans, we have uh, maybe some Australians that haven't met yet. Okay. Now. Is there anyone here that composes music? That's good. Why is it so hard to compose a song? 
So you compose music? Okay, see the rest of the people here don't? Stay over here. He should be on his toes and follow me. <laughs> My other people who see the video knew. But the people that are here can see me even if that's off. Whenever you see a speaker, by the way, who holds on to this for dear life, it's not, it's not, it's not good. It's also a, a mesecha model between the audience and the speaker that there's like this thing protecting me from all the people out there. When you move away from the podium, it's much more, both people, both, both the speaker and the audience, appreciate it more. But if I'm forced to, I'll stand here, but... Okay. The reason why most people here can't compose music, or at least couldn't till today, is because what happens is the following. You try to compose a song, you don't have to change the mic, uh, you try to compose a song, so you do... And then what? The reason why you can't compose a song is because each, every person in this room's brain pretty much went through the library of music in their head, their mental iPod, and tried to find which song they know that that ties into. So maybe I was a little off tune, it's really a different song. It's like the first few bars of L'cha or or Keilad, and you're trying to figure out what the, what the Baltfil is actually trying to sing. And the same thing is true when you meet somebody. You meet somebody and you look at him and you're like, do I know this person? So you go through like the game Guess Who with those little... And when he played Guess Who as a kid, there was this game that you had to guess who the, who the person that uh, the other card or the other player had. So you look through the audience, you look through, you're talking to somebody. And as soon as you meet them, you think, do I know this person? Where might I know them from? Do I know them from Yeshiva? Do I know them from Shul? Do I know them from the neighborhood? Do I know them from business? Do I, and then, okay, do I know, who else do I know that looks like this? Is that scanning, scanning, scanning? And you find somebody in your head that sort of matches that. That is how you say, okay, either I have to make a new entry in my database that somebody knew I haven't met before, or I know this person. So it's sort of the same thing like music, essentially. What I'm trying to say is that you go through everything in your head before you can actually do something new and something different. I don't know who's the furthest, but we have the youngest participant, that's for sure. Most people don't know this, but actually Beethoven, at the end of his life, was deaf. And he composed some really amazing music. If you, look, you can see, actually, from the music that he made in the different stages of his life, you can see that he uses different notes at the end of his life, higher notes. And the way he used to compose, basically, was he would have, he would put his ear to the floor, and he would hear the vibrations of the piano, and that's how he composed the music, which means he wasn't even able to hear the music he was composing, but instead of limiting him in a certain respect, that expanded his horizons, because he wasn't limited to what he thinks, he was going by the vibrations, and that's how he wrote some of the famous pieces that he wrote. Now, The name of the President of the United States, who actually wrote a letter for the Jabez Expo, is President Barack H. Obama. One of the first things he did, one of his major accomplishments, was he won the Nobel Prize for Peace. I think he became President something like 31 days after the you know, before the nomination process for who should win the prize finished, so I don't know how much he was actually able to accomplish in those 31 days to deserve the prize, but we won't go there. But before that, the major accomplishment of President Obama was, or Mr. Obama at the time was, that he was a phenomenal public speaker. Evidently, being a good speaker can uh, get you nominated, okay, make, make you president. Now, the most I know this room is full of people of different ages, but if you ask the average person who remembers, they'll tell you that JFK was the, you know, Mr. Popular, he was the president, he was the Zach, as they would say, probably in Lakewood. Now, if you look at the speeches of JFK, people loved his speeches, there's something very interesting about his speeches. If he spoke for an hour, so, he wasn't actually giving one speech, he was actually giving three speeches. Or rather, five speeches, if I want to divide it that way. What happens is like this. There's three kinds of people, three different modalities of people. There's people that are visual, there's people that are auditory, and there's people that are kinesthetic. What that means is that some people, when you talk to them, as an example, they'll say, I see what you're saying. Some people will say, that sounds right. Some people will say, it doesn't feel right. That's just that sometimes can give you a hint to which modality a person is. But the point is, when someone speaks on stage, 
there's different kinds of people in the audience, there's always going to be one third of the audience that loves the speaker because he's speaking to their modality. So he's using the phrase, phrases that they would use. They may not agree with him on everything he says, but as a speaker, as, as somebody who they're looking for, for to get knowledge from, or as in, in life insurance as an example, someone who sells life insurance, same thing would be true, is that in any business, when the person you're speaking to is speaking in your modality, you're automatically going to like them more than if they were speaking, you know, it's like when you speak to someone who has the same accent as you, I mean, we all think we don't have accents, like me, I mean, someone from Brooklyn, ah, oh, finally met someone without an accent. When you meet someone with a different accent, then suddenly you automatically start judging them a certain way or thinking that, you know, it's harder to do business. When you see them from Texas, by the way, you automatically trust them because they have a laid back Texas accent. And um, when someone speaks in a Yisrael with an American accent, everyone's like, you know, a stupid American. Uh, well, interestingly enough, if you speak Hebrew with a Russian accent, you're better off than speaking with an American accent. Um, will do a better job and you'll get more you know, attention paid to you than and so what JFK would do is the following the first 10 minutes he would speak his language would be visual the next 10 minutes he would speak in, auditor, in a language to the people who would, he would mirror those who are in the audience who are auditory the next 20 minutes I said you know so, so 10 minutes, 10 minutes, and 20 minutes, let's say, and again, doesn't, the exact numbers don't matter, he would switch to a kinesthetic modality, then he would switch back to visual and back to auditory. So at the end of his speech, everyone was like, oh my goodness, that was fantastic, that was amazing. Why? Besides whatever he said, he had good speech writers and you know, he, he was popular, but the fact that he was able to mirror everyone in the audience was very helpful in everyone loving what he had to say. And President Obama actually has, is very similar in that way to um, JFK. And in the PowerPoint, which is not behind me, you can actually see, I took a picture of Obama and a picture of JFK. I sliced them in half by the nose and I put them together, as you can appreciate the similarity between the two presidents and the way they gain popularity through public speaking and knowing how to mirror an audience. When you speak to an audience, when, you speak in a, when, you, when you're in a business meeting, it's not... So, so first of all, there's the modality of the person you're speaking to, which you may know or may not know, depending on, you know, Sometimes you can hear it. If you talk to them for two minutes, you'll hear which modality they are. And that might make a difference in what you say. It certainly might make a difference in what you do. Um, when, a, when a wealthy person gives $25 million donation to a Moisid, so they present him with a very big package of, like a thick, like a legal like a court thing, like a huge thing of papers. Now, the rich guy doesn't read it. He doesn't care about the layout of every classroom. He doesn't care about exact number of square feet of tar that the roof is going to need, and he doesn't care about exactly how many light bulbs. The reason why he's given that big pack of paper is simply because, in his head, before you write a big check in business, there's lots of legal papers, lots of documents to sign, there's something going on here that takes the red light in the head and makes it green and says, okay, I can now sign the check, I can now approve this transaction. So therefore, if a Moise is trying to get from a guy that kind of money, even if he wants to give the check, something in his head, something's wrong. He feels not necessarily likes being scammed, but he feels some, some kind of insecurity that something doesn't, something's wrong here. And presenting him with that big sheaf of papers actually takes away that worry from him and allows him to get that donation. When you're speaking to a person, example, you're speaking to somebody who works for a bank, it would be very helpful to go on LinkedIn, even if you don't connect to the guy, even if you don't know the guy, even if you say, I'm not... Uh, you know, if you don't want to use a computer, I'm not telling you to go use a computer, ask somebody you know to print the guy's profile for you and, and e not email it, fax it to you if the fax is okay. But the bottom line is that if you have the person's LinkedIn profile, what will you see? Well, you'll see that he started in 1981 as an assistant teller or, or the assistant schlepper of the mail guy. And then they became ultimately the, the teller and then they became a branch manager and then they became a... until, until, until they became an executive in Chase Manhattan Bank. Okay, or I look at his LinkedIn profile and I see he started out in all state and then he went someplace else and then he ended up after, you know, Washington Mutual and then he, and after, Dime Savings Bank on Weisberg, I don't know, uh, Investors Bank, I don't know what, who's, who's sponsoring this thing today? Doesn't say anymore. Anyway, and then five years ago he came to Chase as an executive. So when you see that, you know something about this person that you wouldn't otherwise know, which can make a big difference in how you talk to them and what kind of trend, and, and if, or, or if you're speaking to them will make a transaction closer or further. What do I mean by that? A 
go into a bank and I say, I go to this guy in the bank, I say, listen here, I have a new piece of software that you're going to put in your ATM machines. And every transaction, instead of taking 21 seconds on average, it's going to take only 14 seconds on average, which means you'll be saving a lot of time and you'll be, saving your customer, you'll be able to advertise on, on billboards, fastest ATMs in, in, in New York, in New Jersey. It's going to... You're going to be, it's, it's going to be so different and, and the ATM machine, when a person walks over to it, it's going to be like a car. Some cars, you put the key in, so there's, let's say, husband and wife, husband puts his key in, the seat changes, the mirror changes, everything changes to his height and what he, his comforts. And when the wife puts her key in, it gets lower, the mirror changes, maybe the blinkers automatically go on, the hazards more doing when she's driving. But you can make it an ATM machine that when a person comes to the ATM machine and sticks in their car, or even before, just by based on optical uh, recognition, if he's short, the machine should go down. If he's tall, the machine should come up. Anybody, if you patent that, I'll be able to prove prior art because I said it before you patented it by a couple of hours. Um, but essentially, I can say, it, it, you know, instead of the money going, it'll be a hand coming out of the machine that'll go, here's your money. But if I'm, so if I'm talking to a guy who's been with Chase Manhattan his whole life, I'm not going to get the sale. Why? Because I've, the, the reason how, the way he went from being a nobody in Chase Manhattan Bank to being who he is today in Chase Manhattan Bank, the first thing he did was he didn't rock the boat. That means he didn't get involved in politics in the office, he didn't take any risks. If you ever need something from the Department of Motor Vehicles and they close at 4, and you get there at 4 o'clock and 1 second, and you say, please let me in, please let me in, and my clock is L359, the guy doesn't really have a reason to let you in. Why? He works for the government. Unless he does something really, really, really wrong, he's not getting fired. It's a government job. Now, if he doesn't let you in, he's not going to get a, uh, you know, some kind of thing. His boss is not going to let him know. What's the matter with you? You don't let a guy in who comes half a minute late? The rules are the rules. It was 4 o'clock. I shut the door. Again, it's finished. But if I wait, if I let him in, and somebody complains that I let somebody in after the time, and therefore they couldn't, then I might get in trouble. So therefore, the person who works for the government knows, as long as I follow the rules, I'm safe. Same thing's true for this guy who's working for Chase Manhattan Bank. If I don't rock, if I rock the boat, if it works, everyone's going to give me lots of credit. But the way I got here was by playing it safe always. And therefore, doing this, buying this piece of software is, gonna, is not the safest thing because it's going to be change, and change is not a good thing. However, if the guy's LinkedIn profile, as an example, shows the opposite, that he's been jumping around, that means this guy's a risk taker, this guy wants to make it to the next level. Therefore, the language I'll be using with him, I'll be describing to him, would be, and it's going to get higher and lower, and, it's gonna be, and, people, and people are going to appreciate it, it looks so different. But if I'm trying to sell to the first guy, I'm going to say, listen, I'm going to install the software on a Saturday night, 3 o'clock in the morning. By 7 a.m. Sunday morning, it's going to be done. There's going to be no noticeable difference whatsoever to the customer, except on the back end, you'll be saving X number of dollars in transactions, and you know, interbank fees or whatever. So the language that I'll be using with each person would di differ based on what I can find out about them before I speak to them. In addition to while I'm speaking to them, words that they say can give me a real hint into what they need to be told. And by the way, many people in business make this mistake, which is someone says something to you and you want to show you understood, so what do you do? You repeat it back to them. But people that want to really show they understood, what do they do? They try to say it in different words that the person should see the attacker understood because they're even using, they're even, they're not just repeating it like a parrot there. They're showing they understood by saying it differently. I have news for you. When you say it differently, the person doesn't feel you understood. You have to repeat miller by miller what they said back to them. I understood what you want. You want the software to do, and then just mirror their words. Not because you're trying to be a parrot, but because even though you feel stupid repeating the words they just said five minutes ago, repeating those words is much better than using different words. Now, I, I spoke in London, and a week later, one of, the major one of the major Yiddish newspapers called me up and said, I want you to know you caused me a lot of aggravation, because everybody wants the right side of the page this week. Because I mentioned that if you, in an English language publication, you always want to be on the right side, not the left side, because when you turn a page, first you look at the right side, you, first you look at the right side for a split second, then you look at the left, you read it, and you look at the right, you read it. So when you're on the right, you're seen more, and you're more likely not to be skipped than when you're on the left. I told him, I said, why are you complaining to me? Charge 10% premium for, left side, for right side placement. And, and, and. Now, there's a difference between di different kinds of media. There's no right or wrong, but there's different kinds of media, even when you're advertising. When somebody picks up 
a paper which is an advertisement paper. For example, the uh, weekly link might be an example, I assume. The weekly link is a paper, if somebody picks it up, they're not paying for it, they're picking it up and they're looking to be, I guess, entertained or informed by reading advertisements. The thing is advertisements, a bunch of advertisements stapled together. Hopefully most of the ads are formatted decently and have you know, information that's valuable in them and they're given to you. When somebody's reading the Hamodiyah as an example, or the Mishpach or the Ami, whatever it might be, what's happening is something very different. What's happening is I want to read the article. There happens to be an ad there. So if the ad catches me, if the ad pulls me and somehow I read it, then okay, I might, I might take action. And if I do, we'll, we'll get to that in a second, I might take action. But I'm really looking to skip the ads. The ads are there because otherwise it would cost $20 instead of what it cost. However, on a, on a, on a, on a rag, an advertising rag, a shmata paper basically, I'm looking to read advertisements. And I may not be looking to buy, but okay, what's on sale, what's new, what's, you know, what, 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 where's Uncle Moishi going to be chalamoyed, whatever it might be, I'm actually looking at it for that reason. So therefore, it's easier to get someone to see your ad, essentially, in an advertising paper, but if you can get them to see your ad in a better paper, meaning to say a paper that you pay for, a paper that's, then that interaction has a higher value. What I mean to say by that is, is that the average person reading the pay Jewish glossy um, is actually, or, or the Hamadiyya or the Ated, I mean again newspapers, different than magazines, but is, 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 is a, for the most part, somebody that if they, if they don't have lots of extra free time, they're going to be reading that and they're not going to be reading the, uh, you know, the paper that comes in the corner that you take out of those plastic things. So. People look at advertising as far as how much it's going to cost me and how many people are going to see it. It's a whole lot more complicated than that. And you know, on one foot, the easiest thing I could say is that you want to simply test the different. Instead, I'm not going to be a whole share on it for now, but just you just want to test the different the different advertisements, in different places to see what works for you. And the same ad can work in one and not the other. The same ad can work in a quarter page and not work on a half page, or the or you know, or it could be the opposite. Sometimes a quarter page ad can get you a much higher response than a half page ad. And just by the way, I'm not a chusid at all of full page ads as a general rule, so as far as that. By the way, someone's supposed to hold the sign to me and let me know. Okay. Okay, so I'm happy to answer the questions afterwards, but I'm already, now that I mentioned that whatever, I already got the hand waves, okay. Now, People are always looking for something new, something different. We all know this, but still, every single time you go to the supermarket and you see Fruity Pebbles has added green pebbles, or you see that the palm olive detergent or the hand soap has changed something, made it stronger, more powerful, different shape bottle. The ketchup has an easier clean, self-cleaning uh, top this nozzle. The reason why is because people always want something new and something different, and it's important to have something new and something different. Okay, so change something in your offer. I don't care what, I don't care how. Make an hours on Matzah Shabbos. Make, uh, you know, make your cheese, cheese danishes 5% bigger. Or add 5% more cheese, or make them 5% smaller, or make them 5 calories less. But change something. If you don't write that down, then you didn't, that's like the main point of today. Uh, change something in what you offer, because people, uh, when, when, it's, when there's nothing new in there, people don't attach to it the way when it's new and it's exciting and it's different. Um, the Heilige Ben Eshchai says, Seshtat kolam anagas ha-shabbos, noisnum loy kol m'shabbos liboy. That's one. There's another one, very similar. Kolam anagas ha-shabbos, noisnum loy, nachlab li mitzudam. So there's two different mamur. And one is someone who, who, uh, who's ma'anag the shabbos, um, so I don't know how to say ma'anag properly, but uh, no. Someone who, who, who enjo like enjoys the shabbos properly, so there's two. One is, gets whatever his heart desires. He, he, get, he receives whatever his heart desires. The other is, he gets a, a nachle, he gets an inheritance, b'li mitzudim, without boundaries. So the Benishchai asks, well, what, which one is it? Is he getting this? Is he getting this? It seems to be a very similar statement with a different ending. What's pshat? So the Benishchai says that when a person has mishyeh shlemuna, m'savala masayim, someone who has a hundred ziz, wants to have two hundred ziz, which means a person is never happy with what they get because as much as I have, my bank account has a hundred million, I want it to have two hundred million. So therefore, we, 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 we can't be promised that we'll get 
Libayne, a person is going to get Kol Mishalas Liboy because it's impossible. Because whatever he gets, he's going to want more of. Therefore, the Ben Shechai says, it has to be he gets Nachal Bimitsurim, he gets a Nachal, he gets inheritance without boundaries. Since he can't count it, he can't want more yet. If somebody gives you a big pile of money on a silver tray, you don't say, I wish I got two trays of money. What happens is, you say, wow. Then you count it. When you finish counting, you say, only a million. I wish he would have given me two trays, I would have had two million. But until you actually know how much you have, you can't count it, which is why it's a very, it's a very important psychological point to understand how people think. There's a famous uh, psychological thing you can look up. In psychology, it's called Maslow's Pyramid, Maslow's Hierarchy of Needs, M-A-S-L-O-W. Okay, just type in Maslow's Pyramid, you'll find it. And basically what he goes through is the different levels that a person goes through in life. That a person goes through, that a person needs on a daily basis. A person needs shelter, a person needs what to eat. And somewhere up to thing, a person needs, you know, shtisen. Which means that if I'm selling you a drill, a drill might be something important. It's not as important as food and drink, but it's something that a person who you know, feels might be useful to him to have a drill. However, if I was selling a pink drill for teenage girls, then that would be something that might talk to people on a level of a drill, but it also goes much, much higher and talks to people on a, much higher, um, on a much higher level. The more levels you can hit when you're speaking to someone, when you're interacting with someone, that what you're doing here is not just about the level you thought it was, but I can add additional levels to that, the better off you'll be. Fine. Let me finish with one more interesting thing. And then I'm happy to stick around until about 3 in the afternoon. And will be here. Um, There's a, new, there's a website, that I think I mentioned it here last year, it's called harrowhelperreporter.com and the point of helperreporter.com, it's run by a friend of mine, it used to be, he sold it already for a couple of million, a couple of, actually, not, probably took a year from when he started until he sold it, from when it became official. His name is Peter Shankman, he lives in Manhattan. And helperreporter.com is basically, it's a shidduch service. It's a free service where every day there's three emails that are sent out, um, and it says, let's say, looking for an attorney who can comment on uh, if Mr. and Mrs. President and Mrs. Obama will get divorced after they leave the White House. And that might be some random thing I just shout out, but basically they need someone who they can quote in the New York Times, but they can't just have a quote from anybody. It has to be someone who there's a reason for him quoting. So he might be a, he might be a psychologist, he, might, he or she might be a psychologist, might be a divorce attorney, might, but it has to be, so, so therefore what they can do is they're going to ask things looking for commentary about X from someone who's qualified. The one thing you cannot do on Harrow is you cannot spam the person. You cannot say, well, you're doing a story about good gifts for dads, but I have a great gift for pets. You can't really do that. You do that, you get thrown off, and it's not so pleasant. But I did discover a way to reach out more than once. So first of all, Baruch Hashem, when I started, that was one of the places that I really helped me. I, got, I must have gotten, you know, I got some really major quotes there, and, and I turned quotes, Baruch Hashem, into interactions and connections with people, which then led, you know, further on to... Better, and better things, Baruch Hashem. But what I realized was, is you can spam the person. But what you can do is you can be helpful. So for example, the America Online, Shaitai, still around, what I'm saying, there was an article they were doing on America Online about real estate values during, real estate values near a cemetery. Are, is real estate near a cemetery worth buying? Is it not worth buying? How does the cemetery affect real estate values? So it just so happens to be that one of the things that I have in my back pocket was that I was once licensed at the time as a New York State licensed uh, real estate agent. <coughs> So I wrote and I said, a house near a cemetery costs less. Now I knew this information not from, being, not from being licensed in real estate, but that's not the point. Yes, it costs less, but it goes up percentage-wise approximately the same as a house on the more expensive side of town, so that when real estate values rise, it may go up less, but you put in less and you'll take out less, but percentage-wise it's the same, right? So I sent them that response, and they say, Yiddish, I'll find a oil. I sent them a response. They may have gotten 100 responses. Maybe they'll pick mine. Maybe they won't. But then I sent them another email. I spent five minutes of my time. I went on Google. I typed in real estate values near cemetery. And I came with an article. I think it was actually in Haaretz, um, of all places. And it was talking about in Holon, the cemetery, and how it affects real estate values. So I sent the same. Her name was Christina Wagner. I still remember. I sent her a link to this article. And I said, I also found, by the way, I responded earlier, I just found this, but you might find it helpful that the major Israeli newspaper, Haaretz, had an article about this in Israel, and they came to the same conclusion, basically, to what I said, what I said in my previous article. Not only was I quoted in the article, but this piece was also quoted. Not, it didn't thank me for mentioning that, but basically, first of all, I reached out, like a lot of other people, but I did something else. I delivered value. I wasn't a pest. And even if they didn't want to use my piece, they had to thank me for giving them something valuable. And at that point, I can take that and email them and you know, be in touch with them, find out more about them, so on and so forth. And that is true both on Harrow, which might be valuable to many of you, but it's also true in general. 
When you have somebody you want to talk to, don't email them, hi, do you need my help, or anything like that. Spend five minutes, find something really of value to them, and send it to them. They have to be thankful, they have to be happy with the value provided, and that's the way to do business, not by just trying to pitch things to people. Shalom, today and every day,